for years then, we haven't even copyrighted our material. We allow people to copy it, to give it away. That's what we want. We don't take a look at everything Eric Hoven puts out, but when the creator of the multi-award winning Genesis Paradise Lost 3D movie releases his follow-up feature, that's just too big an event to ignore. This time, Eric's movie is taking us to the world famous Grand Canyon. Today, we're going on a journey of discovery. How did the canyon form? And what does it tell us about the past, the present, and the future? The answers could change your life. If the answers can change my life, then I'd say they're worth taking a very close look at. Welcome to Apologia, and our look at the science of scarred earth. Through social media posts, I've been aware that Creation Today's Eric Hovind has been making trips to the Grand Canyon, where he would proclaim uninvited his ideas about the reality of Noah's Flood to some of the 6.5 million people who visit the canyon each year, presumably just to see the views and have a relaxing vacation without getting yelled at by a stranger. This year's tour, we took our own film crew. We stayed around for several days after the tour, and we began to film for this new idea GrandCanyonMovie.com. I can see billboards on the way up to Grand Canyon that say, hey kids, check it out, GrandCanyonMovie.com. I can see people hand them a little card that says relive the experience that has a website, GrandCanyonMovie.com on it. It's my hope that you may be someone who saw a billboard or received a little card from Eric. Hey, nice day, man. Hey, I got this real quick. This is a uh around the two. Maybe you're someone who watched the Scarred Earth movie online, then wanted to go even deeper into the science, did some searching, and found your way here. I hope so. If you've seen the movie, you know that a large portion features Eric interviewing random Grand Canyon visitors and quizzing them on what they know about the science behind the landmark. How do you think the Grand Canyon formed? Uh, was it ice? From the river. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. The humans destroyed everything. Maybe some miracle. The prehistoric, uh, what are they? What do you call them? <laughs> Dinosaurs? I have no idea, actually, man. <laughs> we, should, we should have had the, the science, you know? <laughs> Are you open to scientific evidence that could show that it had to be formed from a catastrophic event? I'm definitely open to hearing your scientific evidence, Eric. Very much so. But I realize that I'm just not that into geology. In fact, if I'm honest with myself, I may not have answered the on-the-spot, in-your-face interview questions significantly better than the people in the movie did. I realize that if I want to learn something about the complicated world of geology, I shouldn't look to average people on vacation, or even to the self-proclaimed guide asking them questions. No, if I really want to learn, I need to bring in an expert. Hey everybody, my name is Steve Bauman. I'm a licensed professional geologist. I got my license in 2011. Yes, geologists can get licensed just like engineers and architects, and we have to take tests like they do. But I got my bachelor's in science in geology in 2001 from Illinois State University. And unlike the people in Eric's Grand Canyon video, I have published in peer-reviewed journals, which is actually quite an accomplishment for somebody with a bachelor's, and as primary author, too, not, not just as secondary or third author. Impressive, Steve. Thanks for being here to help guide us through the film. Let's take a look. Let me ask you this. Do you think there's any evidence that this could have been formed by the biblical flood that's talked about in Genesis chapter 6 and Genesis chapter 7? In Eric's video of the Grand Canyon, he keeps dropping words like scientific evidence, but he never proposes a model. I have never seen a flood model. I had to piece one together from the ramblings of Eric's video just to get a concept. The man on the street interview structure of the film did meander quite a bit, much like the Colorado River that is its focus. For the sake of time, let's consolidate just the specific science claim portions of the film together under the general headings that Eric himself puts forth around the 13 minute mark. There's a link to the full film in the description so that you can check us to make sure everything is included accurately. So, Let's go. Scientific fact number one, the Colorado River starts 3,000 feet above sea level. We're 7,000 feet above sea level. There's no way for a river that starts 3,000 feet above sea level to go uphill and carve out a canyon that's 7,000 feet above sea level. I keep hearing this 3,000 feet is the elevation of the Colorado River, 7,000 feet is the elevation of the canyon walls. Which might indeed be a problem 
if one was to assume that these have always been the elevation levels throughout history, but Eric's own programs attest to the fact that mountain ranges and elevations have changed. Is there enough water to flood the entire world? We, we know from what scripture says that uh, after the flood, there would be the mountains uh, rise, rising up, up, the ocean trenches lowering. Uh, there's an enormous mountain range there, probably produced by some sort of uh, uh, some sort of collision as uh, two um, plate tectonics. Plates, yeah, as, as two plates yeah. collided. So the question is, do we have evidence that the elevations of various portions of the canyon have changed in history? There are plenty of papers that describe in detail the uplift of the Colorado Plateau. That's just a handful of them. So you have Colorado Plateau here, you have the Grand Canyon here, you have a ton of massive lava flows. Well, well that's because of the Laramide orogeny, and orogeny is a mountain building event. You had, where, here? You have continents colliding and rubbing against each other right here. Subduction and a pl continental plate going over it. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's it in a nutshell. So you get these faults and trends and you get different stress fields and you get things like the Colorado Plateau lifting up. You might notice we're not at sea level right now. About 70 or 80 million years ago, this whole area took a tectonic elevator ride straight up, creating this high plateau, but there was still no river and no canyon. But northeast of here, that same uplift created the Rocky Mountains. How can this uplift form a Grand Canyon? You have the Colorado Plateau uplifting. So you have this river meandering through and in cross section, you have Happy Colorado River doing its thing. Now, it's not this simple, but what will uplift produce here? If I start uplifting slowly, but as this uplifts, this doesn't move. What happens is I get uplift. I'm not going to move my Colorado River, but I'm getting uplift and I keep getting uplift. And now my Colorado River has to downcut in order to keep pace with this uplift. And my Colorado move River has not actually physically downcut. It's still near the same elevation as it was before the uplift. It's just relative to the uplifted rocks, it looks like it's cut down. As Eric admits elsewhere, no matter your opinion on the age of the Earth, the area of the Colorado Plateau is higher now than it was when the canyon began, completely negating this uphill river flow objection. Scientific fact number two. On top of where we're standing, there used to be another mile of dirt. Only an idiot calls strata dirt. How do you really feel, Stephen? That has been removed for tens of thousands of square miles. Okay. The Grand Canyon is missing 900 cubic miles of dirt. Mm -hmm. He calls strata dirt at least three times in the video. Sorry, but that's a trigger for geologists. Here's Russ Miller sharing with the group one of the things you don't see at the canyon. Russ, I looked Russ up. Russ didn't even graduate college. He didn't finish, you know, whatever. That happens. I'm not going to hold that against someone. But when you sit there and talk with an authority, like you know your ass from a hole in the ground. And I understand that one of those is very important in geology. And you don't have the credentials, experience, or knowledge to back it up. Anything he's ever learned, he's learned from a creationist website. It's missing 900 cubic miles of sediment. 900. This missing mile and a half of strata is at 900 cubic miles of missing sediment. It's missing 130,000 cubic miles of sediment. Russ doesn't come out and say the technical geological term, but he seems to be talking about an unconformity. An unconformity is... the technical term in geology which refers to places where the aging of rock layers suddenly jumps. Now, technically, the Grand Canyon has a number of unconformities. There's 15, okay? So you have two great unconformities, and then you have 13 minor ones. But creationists tend to focus on the first of the larger ones. It came to be known as Powell's Great Unconformity, and soon geologists discovered it wasn't isolated to the American Southwest. In all, we're talking around 10 billion cubic kilometers of Earth. Just gone. Grand Canyon's nothing compared to the mission strata. It's not even 1%. So where did all the missing strata go? This paper, published in January of 2019, they lay out some pretty convincing evidence that massive glaciers ripped away over a dozen vertical kilometers of rock during a period of the Earth's history many call Snowball Earth. For clarification, Snowball Earth is talking about the late Precambrian Ice Ages. 
not the modern one with mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. In this study, the team also looked at isotopes of oxygen and hafnium, a silvery metal, in about 30,000 zircon crystals. The ratios of these are different enough between the continental crust that forms dry land and the oceanic crust that forms the seabed that it should be clear if either contributed significantly to the magma the crystals came from. And their results suggested that a whole bunch of the Earth's land, as much as 14 vertical kilometers, was dumped into the oceans and then pulled underground and recycled into magma through the process of subduction. It was dispersed worldwide. There's no place you can put your finger on the missing layer. Because it seems that the Ice Age glaciers recycled the missing layers into magma. You can't put your finger on magma. Or at least you shouldn't. The ones that stay in the canyon all agree it formed. Well, 95 percent of them agree it formed in a matter of days. That 95 percent of people who study the canyon agree it is formed in days is also a flat-out lie. I compiled a list of the people that study the Grand Canyon who have authored papers with ages in them. That's 64. That's just out of the ones I've got laying there. List of scientists with legitimate degrees who have looked at the Grand Canyon or written about it. Two. If I take do the math. That means 3% are in favor of young Earth creationism. Massive water flow does massive damage. Imagine that. An entire mile of sediment from above the rim of the Grand Canyon is completely missing. Where he got the mile sediment, I don't know where he pulled that from. He doesn't cite anything. Were there layers above the canyon, present canyon, that were eroded? Probably. Was it a mile thick? Maybe. Was it 1,000 meters? Maybe. Because we do know that there are younger sediments up north in the Colorado Plateau further, like in Utah and stuff. But you can't extrapolate a thickness across state lines like that. You can connect a thickness from a couple of closest points, maybe a couple hundred meters apart, but not 600 kilometers. You can't do that. So as far as I can tell, he pulled that from his backside. Fact number three, all those layers were laid down very quickly. There's no erosion marks in between the layers, which is what you'd get if they were laid down slowly over millions of years. I did an extensive search to find out what Eric means by erosion marks. This isn't a phrase used in geology, or virtually anywhere outside the context of this movie. It probably sounds compelling to a casual park bystander, but unless the phrase erosion mark has meaning, this is an impossible idea to even discuss. What exactly are these marks Eric is looking for? When soft sediment accumulates on top of hard rock, the fine grains fill in all the cracks and holes in the rigid layer below. Just like adding a layer of whipped cream to a parfait fills in all the uneven spacing in the layer below. I got to spend some time with Adam Huff from A Different View Tours. This guy, Adam Huff, comes in. I don't know who this guy is. Of A Different View Tours, that right there sends up red flags. He shed some light on how the layers of the Grand Canyon had to form. You know, right here in the Grand Canyon, we have 10 layers, 4,000 feet thick. These layers are full of billions upon billions of fossils. Our very bottom one down there, we call it the Tapeats sandstone, a layer of sandstone called the Tapeats. We can find that that layer covers about 70% of the United States. You can find that Tapeats up into Canada, down into Mexico. You can go to the other side of the globe and find Tapeats sandstone in Africa and Europe and parts of the Middle East. That layer is global in scale. The Tapeats sandstone, along with many other sandstones, like the Mount Simon, the Munising, and others in throughout North America, Mark the beginning of what's called the Sauk Sequence. This claim that the Tapeat Sandstone is all over North America is crap. If it wasn't, we wouldn't have different names for different formations like the ones I just mentioned. You can't just look at the top of the Great Unconformity and go, oh, that's all the same unit. That's not how correlation works. You know, if someone would actually read the North American Stratigraphic Code and actually take a geology course, they might know that. And also the Sauk Sequence, which is a package of rocks, is known as the Great American Carbonate Bank for a reason, because three quarters of it is mostly carbonate rock, not sandstone. You know, we have some layers that are local, some are more regional or continental, and some that are global. And they're like a big old stack of pancakes, right? You got one on top of the other. And where one touches the, the one underneath of it is a very flat contact point, very smooth. Remember the parfait we talked about? Why would you expect the layers not to be smooth? That the great unconformity in the Grand Canyon is flat means absolutely nothing. If I took you to Baraboo, Wisconsin, along the North Limb near Abelman's Gorge, where every geologist in the Midwest goes for structural geology, what you would see is the great unconformity changes. In some places, it's nearly level. 
In other places, it's vertical because what happened is the Baraboo Quartzite is pre-Cambrian. It was folded into a syncline, you, and you can put your finger right on it. You have a vertical great unconformity. You can put your finger right on the vertical cliffs of the Baraboo Quartzite right next to the nearly level beds of the Cambrian sandstone. So, that is an in-place, real-world example of where the Great Unconformity is not flat. I have to conclude that some large catastrophic event laid all this down quickly and buried lots of animals in the process. I have to agree with the flood model. I've never seen a catastrophic flood model. I don't know anyone who ever has. Science models aren't just arguments. As a matter of fact, arguments in science are, and hard science are used as a starting point. They are not evidence, okay? You cannot falsify a scientific concept with an argument. In order to falsify something, you need to put forth your own hypothesis. You need to develop testable models that make predictions that can be falsified. If you cannot do that, you do not have a scientific model. There's no growth of root structures into the layers, which means they didn't even have time to grow roots or trees. Why would you expect that? They hadn't evolved yet. The Paleozoic, <laughs> even the Tapete Sandstone, which is at the very bottom of the Paleozoic sequence of the Grand Canyon, there were no land plants yet. There was nothing to have roots, okay? We do see critters. Grand Canyon Supergroup below, you know what we see? Stromatolites. That's it. That is all we see. We see nothing else. And they find radioactive material from the top all the way to the bottom that's the same. Even utilizing Eric's creation-only search engine, the only research I was able to find was this 30-year-old article by the Institute for Creation Research, put out on April 1st, of all days, that dated some of the lava that has flowed into the canyon since its formation. If you see here, we have Vulcan's Throne, 80,000-year-old lava flows in the canyon. <laughs> We've had lava dam the canyon before. Since the actual spilling of lava magma from the top to the bottom happened quickly before hardening, naturally the radiometric material at the top of the lava spill and the bottom of the lava spill is going to be the same. To hear Eric explain it, you'd think he's talking about material in the sediment layers. Hoven mentions not a single lava at all. Notice how the walls of the canyon are sheer cliffs, yet they're made of soft sediment limestone and sandstone, sediment that would not hold up over long periods of time. Eric Hoss, <laughs> soft sediment, as if you can go in there and pull it out with your hand. No, it's not. It's indurated. It's rock. The basement rock, the Venetia, as a matter of fact, the lowest exposed group in the canyon is crystalline, metamorphic, and igneous rock. It's hard. It's no soft sediments at all. And then above that, which Eric does not even take into account in his model at all, is the Grand Canyon Supergroup, which is all Precambrian. This is a pretty good representation of the Grand Canyon. The orange is Paleozoic, the yellow is Cenozoic, the green just represents the Grand Canyon Supergroup, and the Basal Venetia Group is just gray, all right? The Grand Canyon Supergroup is 3,600 meters thick. The Paleozoic is 1,200 meters thick at its thickest. So the Grand Canyon is three times thicker than this orange part. Hovind and crew pretend like none of this exists and nothing yellow exists. The sheer cliff walls of the canyon are stable, indicating in geologic time, this erosion event took place recently. The canyon is not made of sheer cliffs. No canyon is made of sheer cliffs. They are vertical at the top and they slowly slope down as you get towards the Colorado River, all right? But they're still pretty high. But the claim that they're sheer cliffs throughout the entire canyon is wrong. Over long periods of time, soft stone like limestone and sandstone easily break away from the cliff face. The pieces that fall off fall to the ground and we call that talus. I'm here in one of the side canyons to the Grand Canyon. When we look at the floor of the canyon, it's pretty clean. There's not very much talus that has fallen to the ground. Because there's no water flowing through the canyon floor now to remove the talus, this is evidence that this erosion event took place fairly recently. There is talus in the Grand Canyon in the form of massive landslides. You know, what's the difference if something this small falls off a mountain or half the mountain falls? It's still falling <laughs> into the valley, right? As a matter of fact, there was a whole thesis in 2015 mapping and trying to date these landslides. But in the study area alone, one mile, 1.6 kilometers. You can see there's massive, highlighted them in yellow, there's massive landslides. So I don't know where this concept of no talus comes from. 
when a river carves out a canyon, it forms a delta at the end and it deposits all the sediment. Right. You can't find the sediment at the, in the delta. Hello there, I'm William Farrell. Recently, we've been hearing some talk of a little problem in the Colorado River Delta. There's actually a very small delta. That is absolutely incorrect. The Colorado River goes through Arizona, comes down into the Gulf of California. There is a delta here. Whatever washed this out came through with so much force and so much water, it even washed the delta away. The way to fix this thing is to send money so myself and some other scientists can begin the process of moving a small portion of the ocean back toward the wet part of the river, from there to there. This tells us it couldn't have been the Colorado River for a long period of time. The Colorado River is one of the most loved and hardest working rivers in the world. There was so much water coming through the canyon that not only did it wash away the dirt from the canyon, it also washed it out of the delta with no sign of 900 cubic miles of sediment downstream there had to be a lot of water flowing through here. You know, water isn't the only thing that can move sediment. There's also something else going on here. We have two plates, tectonic plates, sliding past one another. This paper is the end result of an extensive study of the displacement history of Baja California and the San Andreas Fault System. It turns out that what is now the Fish Creek Vallecito section of Southern California used to be part of the Colorado River Delta Plain. But in the past 2.8 million years, Plate movement has shifted the area approximately 130 kilometers northwest. As the land moved, it took a lot of what can be identified as the Grand Canyon sediment with it, as affirmed in this paper, which mapped the matches in sand type, makeup, and ditrital zircon evidence. Additionally, significant winds in the area carry Colorado River sediment as far as the Atlantic Ocean. The sediment from the limestone and dolomite layers of the canyon would simply have dissolved, and while it is no longer a massive force due to man-made reservoirs, the Colorado River continues to drain enough sediment in the ocean to be seen from satellite photos. There are plenty of signs of this dispersed sediment. One must simply look beyond the most obvious. While I admire your passion for the earth and I loved you in Dances with the Wolves, when it comes to restoring the delta, you're out of your league, all right? You, you want people to listen to facts and science and that's not what this is about. This is a very good clue in telling us exactly what happened at the Grand Canyon. <laughs> and that's the extent of the science claim Eric puts forth in the movie. I hope we've been able to demonstrate today that some of Eric's claims need a little more investigation. I mean, children can think more complex than that. Small children, like toddlers. I do wish you'd tell us what you really think, Stephen. The last 50 minutes of the movie was just Eric doing his best Ray Comfort street evangelism impression. How many lies have you told? <laughs> we just told them all. <laughs> Frank, by your own admission, you're a liar, you're a blasphemer, <laughs> and you've you committed adultery of the heart. So if you'd like to see that, you can find a link to the full movie in the description. As you may have guessed, geology is not my favorite research topic, so I want to thank Stephen Bauman, who generously gave of his time and expertise to help us navigate the science of the film. He has a YouTube channel that covers all kinds of geology-related topics. For stuff I don't think is boring, but other people do. Ridiculous. I had to keep the reins on Stephen here today, but I think you can tell he makes these potentially dry topics highly interesting. The link to his channel is in the description. Go check it out and subscribe and tell him Apologia sent you. But before we go, Steve and I want to acknowledge the sudden passing of our dear mutual friend and friend of the science and skeptic community, Cy Strike. If you've been following my channel, you might recall that Sai was my very first ever guest. All right, Sai Strike on the chat. Sai Strike says, throw one out there for Sai Strike. Damn it, Eric. I told you to stop saying my- Sai Strike, where do you come from? I was just telling everyone about the webinar Eric invited us to. Ha, huh, you think I was invited to that thing? Whenever Eric Hovind says my channel name three times, I magically appear. Like Beetlejuice? Exactly like Beetlejuice. We split and co-produced the 13-part series is Genesis History Science. He was my silent partner on the entirety of the Science of Genesis Paradise Lost series. He helped often with traveling to shoot and donate event footage, like this July's Ark Encounter protest. And in the very last conversation I had with him, he was excited to find out about Eric's Grand Canyon movie, and was anxious and excited to be a part of this very video that you're watching now. Tragically, a car accident took him from us before that could happen. But Steve and I knew that Cy would want us to finish it. And so we have. Sci Strikes movie nights have been a safe haven for me nearly every Friday night for years. 
so it is a bit unreal to think that his jovial Hi Paul greeting will no longer light my week. Oh, hi Paul! Oh, hey Paul! Hey Paul, how's it hey, going there? So I didn't like for people to know the good he was doing, but I witnessed just a glimpse of his constant real world giving of time, money, and resources to anyone in need to an extent that defies the mere word generous. If there were secular saints, Sai would be first in line. <laughs> and so, for you, my dear friend, I miss you already. Bring on the pug. <laughs> <laughs>